Okay, so this is the third and last lecture on torture. Um, and so I just want to um, review just very quickly some of the things we've talked about in the first two um, lectures. So be thinking about how does the state carry out torture? Think about the Cambodian case. Think about the German case. Think about the states that carry out torture today. Who are the victims? Who are the targets? And what are the characteristics of these victims? And why do states engage in torture? What's the rationale? What does the state hope to accomplish? There's some additional readings in the Kate Millett book that I don't assign that might interest you. For example, um, there is a chapter on Algiers that tells the story of Henri Aligue, who was a French journalist and a victim of torture by his own French government because he was um, writing about the Algerian independence movement. And so one thing, does it matter if the torture is inflicted on one's own? And how does it become acceptable to torture barbarians but not one of their own citizens? Because uh, the French government um, was really having to explain how it is that they came about to torture uh, a French citizen, a French national. Um, and so Millet really starts to talk about torture uh, coming by different... Uh, in, in terms of the differences in race, color, occupying forces, and in gender, mm -hmm. and that this in colonial imperial relationship really offers some insight into torture. So we're going to talk about a couple of cases ab about where you had a colonial imperial relationship. One is with uh, Northern Ireland, the other one is South Africa, and so I want to talk about those two cases um, um, next, okay? Um, so, but what is the rationale and how does the state hope to accomplish this act of state torture? All right, these are some pictures that I actually took uh, when I had the opportunity to go to B uh, Dublin a couple of years ago, well, several years ago. And this is where the movie In the Name of the Father was filmed. This is Kiliman Jail. And um, then The Name of the Father is a movie uh, starring Daniel Day Lewis, who portrays an IRA or a young man who's accused of being an IRA um, uh, soldier, if you will, and gets thrown into jail with his father and about their relationship and, and the treatment by the British government of IRA um, prisoners in the, in the jail cell. And so um, here you can read, Beware of the risen people. They have hurried and held, yet they wave. Uh, yet they wave bullied and bribed. Um, and so this is um, kind of a statement against um, those people who are holding, holding them hostage, or not hostage, but in, in jail. And the case that I want to highlight is that of Bobby Sands. And so this is um, one of the articles in the, the book dealing with uh, torture. And so this is selection um, 5.4, One Day in My Life by Bobby Sands. Um, and Bobby Sands um, joins the IRA, gets um, thrown in jail on several occasions, um, but at one point the British government starts to treat uh, the IRA as, as, as criminals as opposed to what the IRA saw themselves as, as soldiers. And so Bobby Sands and many others engaged in a hunger strike um, and he ends up dying in prison. So these are pictures of his uh, funeral as well. If you travel in Northern Ireland in the Belfast area, you will find murals of Bobby Sands still on the sides of, um, of buildings there. And so he died in 1981. So this is close to a little over 30 years ago. And while he is a prisoner in the jail, he gets elected to the parliament uh, as a representative of Northern Ireland, but he never really gets to actually participate because he's, he's in prison. All right, so we want to talk about the Northern Ireland case. And so one thing to be thinking about as you read not only the piece in the reader, but also the chapter on Northern Ireland in the Millet book are what are the methods used by the British to try to extract confessions in Northern Ireland? and what were the effects on the victims, according to Millet. And so, how did the British get away with this? How did they get away with the torture? Um, are the Irish POWs, that's how they see themselves, or do the Northern Irish, uh, the, the British consider the Northern Irish, uh, the Northern Ireland, uh, Irish uh, mere criminals, petty criminals, if you will? So what does this have to do with the Irish reaction? And then how can we, if at all, 
compare this to the U.S. treatment of prisoners in Guantanamo Bay or at the Abu Ghraib uh, prison uh, a few years back. So think about how the British um, got away with the torture, um, describe the, uh, the conditions as cruel, unusual, um, the British do, but they don't really think of it as torture. Um, so they try to control the story, they try to control the media, um, they resist, um, the, the, the Irish do becoming criminals, um, and they want to be considered prisoners of war, which would give them very different treatment, they believe, in prison. Um, so um, back to the question we asked earlier, can this type of torture ever be justified? And um, the, the memoirs of, of Bobby Sands are still outlawed in Northern Ireland, um, but we can get a hold of them here. Um, and so that's some of the excerpts that you see in the, um, in the piece um, that he has written his own, in, his, in his own voice about the treatment that he received while in custody of the British. Um, so uh, this is selection 5.4 and this is excerpted from the book called One Day in My Life um, that's put out by the Bobby Sands Trust and so he goes through and talks about his treatment, um, uh, who these individuals are, what kind of torture he was um, um, subjected to, how they um, use some psychological torture about what they're going to do to his wife who happens to be pregnant. Um, and so it's a very um, hard reading to digest because it gets pretty graphic. Um, well, what about the South Africa case in apartheid? And um, this is pretty timely coming upon the, the passing of Nelson Mandela a few weeks ago. Um, but the Millet book talks about the case of Mark Mathabane, and this is a, a picture of him. And so one thing to consider is how is apartheid and Nazism or life for Jews alike about this kind of scapegoating the other, and how does torture affect children? And so the piece in the Millet book really goes into this aspect, and Mark Mathabane <laughs> provides um, a picture for us uh, in terms of what happens to him and his sister and his mother um, in chapter 5 of the Millet book the, entitled The Apartheid System in South Africa. Okay. Um, so I want to kind of give you some b more background on the apartheid system and think about what happened to the continent of Africa through colonial, uh, colonialization and imperialism. And so this is a map that I use quite often to show nations of individuals, nations of, of African um, uh, groups. And the lighter colored lines are the imposition of states and how the continent was carved up by the West. Um, and so you can see where you have nations spread about, many na uh, nations of Africans that are spread across several different states that come into play. And so this breaks up a traditional tribe into different states which makes it difficult for governance. Um, and so you have a mismatch between the nation of people and the state where these people live and this oftentimes leads to civil conflict. Okay, so just briefly that was the early colonial period um, that occurred in um, the African continent. So very early on you have the Portuguese, the, D the Dutch, and the British really trying to get around uh, the continent of Africa in order to trade with the Far East. And so eventually the British are taking control in the 1800s. And this is where they come into contact with Shaka Zula and the Zula Empire um, uh, in the early 1800s. After that period, you have the second wave of colonialism, which is really focusing a lot on the British and the Dutch in South Africa, in the southern part of the continent. So you have the Boers, which are Dutch. They leave and settle in the Transvaal region. You have the British annexing this Transvaal region, and then you have the first and second Boer Wars um, occurring in the 1880s and the late 1890s um, uh, in terms of trying to control this particular region. All right. So, colonialism in 1914, this is on the eve of World War I, you can see that the African continent is occupied in, in terms of colonies by European powers. So the Belgians, Belgian Congo, this is the, 
the purview of the Belgians, and this is where Rwanda and the genocide will occur. You see, Rwanda doesn't exist yet, but it's in this little area right here where um, the Belgians, uh, where the Rwanda genocide will occur later. France is all in North Africa, okay, and so not only were the French very active in French Indochina in the, in the, in the Far East, but they had a stronghold on the northern part of, of, of Africa. And so the chapter in the Millet book that talks about uh, Henri Aligue is a French journalist. This is during the Algerian War of Independence. Uh, Germany has a few uh, powers, uh, a few uh, positions in, in Africa. Great Britain, of course, is very active in Egypt the Sudan, um, and then of course in South Africa, Rhodesia, Northern Rhodesia. Um, Italy is on the horn here. Portugal has a little bit of influence still left in Angola, for example. Spain is um, dabbling a little bit in, in um, up here in terms of uh, the northern part of uh, the Sahara, uh, the, the desert regions. And then there are a couple of countries that are actually independent. Um, um, uh, Liberia, for example, the Empire of Ethiopia, and so most, if not, you know, just about all of the African continent is occupied by 1914. Okay, in 1910, you have the Union of South Africa forming, okay, and so we're starting to focus primarily on the country of South Africa. By 1912, you have a Native National Congress, later called the African National Congress or the ANC, and this is the, 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 the Native Indigenous Populations Movement. But in 1913, the Land Act forbids blacks from buying land outside of regions called reserves where the colonial powers, Great Britain and the Dutch, have required them to live. So this is the, the apartheid. And remember laws in Germany that, that dictated what kind of property Jews could earn, uh, um, own. Uh, Jim Crow laws in the South about ownership, the Special Powers Acts that were um, passed by Great Britain and Northern Ireland, for, you know, limiting what the Irish could own. So you start to see patterns about how um, a colonializing power subjugates those people that they are um, colonizing, if you will. Okay. In 1914, you have the National Party. Uh, founded that represents the Afrikaner's interests, and an Afrikaner is a South African of European descent. Okay, so these are the whites in South Africa. And by 1918, you have the Secret Brotherhood organization founded that's going to further the Afrikaner's cause. And so you can see some pictures. It kind of looks like a Western picture from the United States, but these are European descendants of individuals that colonize the region of South Africa, and these are called Afrikaners. Okay. The term Afrikan is a word for apartness, okay, and so they developed this policy of separate development. Um, and so what white South Africans wanted was to somehow control the development and they wanted it to be separate. It's very much like um, segregation in the U.S. South, okay. So there was this Population Registration Act in 1950 that required South Africans be placed into three different racial groups. You had the Bantu, which is the name for black Africans, you had the whites, and then you had colored, uh, which is a mixed race in um, South Africa. Um, and again, this should look somewhat familiar um, from U.S. history about for use by white persons, and this is in the Afrikaner language, or language of, uh, it's kind of Germanic, if you will, um, to allow for a clear understanding for everybody. A fourth group was added as you had more and more immigration, and these are the Asians from India and Pakistan. Okay. Uh, as time goes into the 1950s, you had additional land acts that were passed that restricted um, individuals to specified areas in the country. And so again, this Durban Beach is reserved for members of the white race group. All right. So these are, are um, prevalent signs that are all over South Africa. So whites controlled 80% of the land while Africans make up 80% of the population. This is commonly known as a Pareto principle. 
where you can take any a lot of different phenomenon and break it into these kinds of statistics. The eight, or it's also known as the 80-20 rule. So other examples are 80% of the world's wealth is in the uh, global north, um, while 80% of the population is in the global south. More kind of a personal thing, you can kind of look in your closet. You wear 20% uh, of your uh, wardrobe 80% of the time. You listen to 20% um, of your CDs 80% of the time. So in, uh, in South Africa, whites controlled 80% of the land. But Africans, black Africans, make up 80% of the population. So you start to see this white minority control of, of land and wealth where, where black Africans made up 80% of the population. All right. Um, the, the policy is set into law in 1948, and so you have these Group Areas Acts of the 1950s, so you have the segregation between blacks and whites. The communist parties are banned, and this is when you start to see the emergence of Nelson Mandela. And this is a picture of a very young Nelson Mandela before he's imprisoned, uh, wearing a traditional beaded collar. And he becomes a member of the ANC, and then this ANC is banned. Uh, in 1960. So this political party, if you will, is banned by the South African government. And not only was the ANC banned, but images of Mandela were banned by the apartheid government as well. Well, South Africa gets its independence um, from Great Britain in 1961. So now it's its own independent country. It's no longer a colonized state. Very quickly, Mandela is imprisoned for life in 1964 and we know his story that he stays there for 30 years. Um, well, what is the international response to apartheid? Well, very early on, South Africans are banned from Olympic competition and other cultural events, all right? Uh, in 1962, the General Assembly of the UN uh, condemns the South African government. There's actually a UN Security Council sanction for 30 years, but it's voluntary, so there's not a lot of um, Changes made in, uh, in, the, in the initial years, but over time it starts to increase in pressure. The 1980s, uh, you see an increase in violence and protests. So one of those is the Soweto Township Uprising. Um, you can uh, Google that particular phrase and you can find videos upon the, uh, the uprising and it's very reminiscent of what you saw in the 1960s and 70s in the United States with riots. Uh, and um, violent and protest movements. Um, of course, these uprisings brought even stronger laws um, uh, um, uh, against uh, the South African government, so it brought more stringent sanctions, and economic interests and in countries started to divest from South Africa. So you start to have a lot more economic pressure brought to um, the South African government. So major corporations started to leave and take away their financial support or, or companies out of South Africa, and that's called divestment. Okay. Um, Ma Nelson Mandela is obviously one of the um, um, leaders of the uh, anti-apartheid movement. Um, but during the 60s and 70s and 80s, he is in jail. And so you have other individuals that are playing a key role in um, what's going on in South Africa in terms of the anti-apartheid activity. And one of these is Stephen Biko. And um, this is a movie, if you're interested in this particular topic, called Cry Freedom. And I just want to show you this video. So just to let you know, the video runs about 26 minutes. And so... Um, you could probably fast forward if you didn't want to watch the whole video, but I'm going to embed it here anyway. So this particular lecture will seem much longer, but this is a, a very interesting, uh, about 25, 26 minute uh, mini documentary, if you will, on the life and influence of Stephen Biko and the impact he had on the um, uh, the anti apartheid anti anti-apartheid, excuse me, movement in South Africa at the time when Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. Of course, there's going to be a cartoon, I mean, an advertisement, so I'm going to get rid of that. Look at all the reasons given down the year. Okay, so here's the video.
Steve Biko. On behalf of the African National Congress of South Africa, I come to salute you and all the comrades in arms who have been murdered under torture. Sunday, September the 25th, 20,000 black South Africans came to mourn Steve Biko, the non-violent but militant black radical leader who died mysteriously in police custody. The South African... Sunday, September the 25th, 20,000 black South Africans came to mourn Steve Biko, the non-violent but militant black radical leader who died mysteriously in police custody. The South African government announced that Biko had died after a week-long hunger strike. Biko, who was in good health, was the 20th man to die in police custody since the June riots last year. The announcement was greeted internationally with shock and anger. Tonight, we explore why this man was so important and the likely impact of his death on the future of race relations in South Africa. Donald Woods is the editor of a leading South African newspaper and was a close friend of Steve Biko. Well, he was the special hero of the young black South African political activists. He articulated their philosophy for them. He was the founder of four movements which had a special bearing on their problems. And he was the, you might say, the spiritual head of them all and the advisor and guide of these movements. So he occupied a very special place at the age of 30. He was just young enough to be acknowledged as the leader of the youth and just mature enough to be able to do so wisely. The Minister of Justice, James Kruger, the man ultimately responsible for the treatment of detainees, told a Nationalist Party conference that Biko's death left him cold. He also joked openly about it. But faced with an international outcry, he withdrew his earlier statement that Biko died in a hunger strike. If you look at all the reasons given down the years for the deaths of detainees, no reasonable person would believe most of them. Secondly, in Steve's case, I knew he would never harm himself physically in there. He had given me to understand quite plainly that if he was detained and he died in detention and it was alleged that he had done anything which brought about his death, such as um, hanging, you know, this is the one often given out, um, cutting himself something, or suffocating himself, pillow, anything like that, or starvation. Um, then I, I would know it wasn't true. The inquest has yet to be held. In Washington, we spoke to an American senator who'd recently met Biko. He's the chairman of the Senate subcommittee on Africa, Dick Clark. I think it's uh, not clear what uh, Steve Biko's death will uh, have or what kind of influence it might have on American policy. Certainly it's going to, I think, cause most Americans, uh, both in government and out, to be more and more reluctant to uh, have a relationship with South Africa. I've always felt that the Prime Minister uh, Forster was right in saying that the United States couldn't meddle in South African policy, but I think we ought to meddle in our own, and that's what we're talking about. Should we continue investments and loans and other kinds of relationships with a government that participates in this kind of activity? Should we be supporting apartheid? That'll really be the question, I think, that we'll have to answer in this country. I think we come closer and closer after events of this kind to saying that we're ready to wash our hands of that. and if, uh, Mr. Forrester and uh, the South African government want to uh, operate in this way. They're going to have to do it in a very isolated world, as far as we're concerned. And Andrew Young, America's black ambassador to the United Nations, said when he heard the news, no nation can afford to lose its most dedicated and creative leadership and yet prosper. I know personally how much the United States suffered nationally as a result of the similarly tragic deaths of President John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Senator Robert F. Kennedy. Certainly a future non-racial South Africa will mourn the loss of a dedicated native son, Mr. Biko. Few people in Britain had ever heard of Steve Biko before his death, but one man who knew him well was Sir Robert Burley, the former headmaster of Eton. Yes, I was out in South Africa, I think it was in 1970. Uh, I'd been asked by the st students at the English University at Durban 
to give a lecture on academic freedom, and after it, two of them took me along to the students, the, the African students' hostel for the medical school. And um, I'd never heard of it before that. I, do, I don't suppose many people had at that time. And, the, um, and I, I found him one of the most interesting young men I've ever met in my life, straight away, and uh, had an, an astonishing conversation with him which um, at once convinced me that uh, here was somebody who was going to mean something. He said to me, mind you, there's got to be a white contribution too. We're not the only people in this country. And I thought when I heard that, I thought now that's one of the most encouraging remarks I've heard. And I must say it didn't surprise me altogether to find that he came from an African. The announcement of Biko's death led to memorial services throughout South Africa. In London, there was one at St. Paul's Cathedral, attended by, among others, Foreign Secretary Dr. David Owen. We have watched the men at their labor, and have watched the overseer with hands folded sneer at the sweat as it trickled down their backs in the sweltering sun. And the world has seen the scene, but says nothing. But still, we must finish the story. What does one say to you, O oh love, O oh brother? For you are of it, and you are in it. Yet we do not speak it with one another. For you and we are one. understand why Steve Biko could inspire such powerful tributes, we went to South Africa, to his birthplace, a small town in the Eastern Cape called King Williamstown. He was banned here in 1973 because of his political activities. This meant he couldn't take part in public life or meet more than one person at a time, and he was forbidden to travel. King Williamstown is a typical segregated provincial South African town. The whites live comfortably in pleasant suburban streets, the blacks live outside it in shanty towns. The blacks have no civil rights. In this unlikely setting, Steve Biko turned King Williamstown into a center for black radicalism, demanding equal rights for blacks and preparing the way for a multiracial society, breaking the apartheid system. A close friend and political associate of Steve Biko was Malusi Mpuluana. He had a way of, you know, of, of appealing to people on a social basis. You know, his first striking thing about him is that he, he is a very friendly person, and a person that is always ready, he was quite selfless, you know, the person that is always ready to go out of his way to assist the next man. And uh, to a point where, you know, even in the township here where he stayed at Ginsburg, he was not a lawyer, but everybody that had a problem of whatever nature, they would go to his home, you know, just to consult him. Uh, you know, it became so much that it was sometimes very difficult for him to do any other work during weekends, you know, but just to sit and listen to people's problems. I would say the time that he, you know, he spent with people led him to setting up all these projects that one sees around Steve. And uh, they led to a greater conviction on his part that there was a need, a greater need, for blacks to really pull up their socks, you know, to, to begin to do things themselves. Biko was undaunted by the apparently insuperable obstacles of the apartheid system. As a medical student, he formed the first black South African Students' Union. Then, forced to give up his studies and confine to his hometown, he started a trust fund for the families of political prisoners. And the fund to help young blacks get educated in town, he started a trust fund for the families of political prisoners. And the fund to help young blacks get education. One thing that I think was very important in his drive with about everything that he handled is that he was a man who liked challenges. Uh, he would take on any challenge, anything that one would see as perhaps too difficult or perhaps uh, you know bit much more advanced than can be expected uh, of his capability. That's the one thing that he'd want to take on just to prove that he can make it. This clinic just outside King Williamstown is a monument to Biko's work. As a would-be doctor, he knew about the need for health care 
but he also saw the clinic which he created as a practical way of developing self-reliance. The clinic has been open for two years. Despite its success, the government eventually banned Biko from having anything to do with it. Today, the clinic has to buy drugs on the commercial market for TB and for immunization, drugs normally available free in South Africa. Nowhere was Biko's influence more felt than in the new movement of black consciousness or the pride in being black. Steve Biko was one of the founders of the BPC, the Black People's Convention, in 1972. This movement dedicates itself to the overthrow of apartheid by non-violent means. Many of its members have been persecuted, detained or forced into exile. The current president is Kenneth Rashidi. Is there any hope? of a non-violent, non-racist future for South Africa. Right now, what I can say, from my personal point of view, is that um, the ball is definitely with the, with the government. The people still accept, and they accept our weight, that uh, black and white people are here to stay together. But our main worry, in our positions, in trying to promote this kind of non-racial society, is that the government is clamping on the black people harder than ever. And this is becoming it may become difficult in the future for us to convince the black people that the real issue is that black and white must live together here. But we are up to try our best to let, to let people realize that. We understand and appreciate the problems that the government is facing. Anybody who is in power does not have to power. Despite the fact that he realizes that he's a minority group, they call us racists when they are racist and they are in the minority, but they want to rule us, which is, to me, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a social ethic which can't be accepted anyway. Our organization is not anti-white. We are just purely pro-black. Our intention is that uh, the black man has got to be on his own to solve his problems. The black man can't solve his problems with a man that is oppressing him. He's got to be on his own, and we've got to be unified, we've got to be solidified, so that we can face our problems. And that is what the government is fearing, because this is gaining momentum and we are marching towards the total unity of the black men in South Africa. Biko himself was detained by the security police four times, but such actions didn't stop King Williamstown becoming the center of black radicalism. By coincidence, only last year, World in Action, in documenting the political repression of blacks after the June riots, highlighted the case of a detainee who was a friend and associate of Biko's and was, like him, restricted to King Williamstown. Mapetlo Muhaki allegedly hanged himself with two pairs of jeans while in custody. Last year, his widow spoke to us. What happened to the two doctors? Your two doctors have been present at that post-mortem. They are both detained at the present moment under internal act, this internal security act. What was the date of the post-mortem? The date of the post-mortem was the 6th. So he died on the 5th of August, the yeah, post-mortem yes. was on the 6th yeah, of August. Then yeah. on the 13th of August, the first doctor was detained. And when was the second doctor detained? The second doctor was detained on the 29th. He was one of the speakers of the funeral. A year after the event, there's still no satisfactory explanation of how Mapetlu Mahati came to die. People detained by the security police have no contact with the outside world and are at the mercy of their custodians. Mrs. Hanoli Muhafi was herself detained in August about the same time as Steve Biko. No one knows where she is. When something like this happens, they don't find it to be very funny because it has been happening for a long, long time. And uh, this is uh, the pattern. You can realize that if Muhafi died last year and his wife now is in detention, you can imagine where the kids are. But I mean, they're, they're all right. Black people are with them. We were able to trace the Muhafi children in the township, two little girls, Konedi, age two, and Matebo, age four. With their father dead and their mother detained, they were being looked after by neighbors. It was for circumstances like these that Biko set up the trust fund for political prisoners. I think that the state, the Nationalist Party government, is crazed with fear of blacks. After nearly 30 years of exploiting racial prejudice by a white minority, 
They're not caught up in the web of their own bigotry and fear. How has his death affected you personally? Well, it's now um, nearly two weeks since we had the news, and it's still extremely hard to believe that this has happened. Personally, it's, it seems hard to accept that we won't see him again. And frankly, I don't know when all the activity of trying to find out who is responsible for it is over, when the inquest is over and such prosecutions as follow according to what's indicated by the inquest, I frankly don't know how my wife and I are going to adjust after that. At the moment we kept very busy with involvement in this process, but after that we'll have to face up to the fact that uh, he isn't there for us to see anymore. This is the younger of Steve Biko's two sons, Samora, age two. He was born on August the 15th, 1975. He never had a first birthday party because on August the 15th, 1976, his father's friend, Mafetle Muhafi, was buried. His father was there for his second birthday, but three days later he was detained and never returned. Samora still runs to the telephone expecting to hear his father's voice. Samora's mother and Steve Biko's widow is Mrs. Nsiki Biko. Well, if, if it were he was on our strike, I don't think it would have killed him. Yes, especially, you know, quoting the number of days they say he, he, he was refusing food. I don't think that would have killed him. Unless they were giving him bad food. I know he doesn't like bad food, of course. But I don't think that would have killed him. But he's a strong man. Very much strong, healthy. You, you never get to, you, you're never ill. You know, seriously, except for one illness he had, some pneumonia. And after that, he was just strong. He has been a strong man, really. With so many people dead or in detention, do you ever feel like giving up? Well, we do expect, you know, during a struggle, obviously, we expect anything, you know, anything can happen. But I just can't understand why people, you know, are, are not brought before court if they are found guilty or they are charged. Well, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, these detentions and, uh, you know, banning orders, uh, they don't mean anything. I mean, if a man is found guilty or if a man, they find that the man is guilty of some offense, he must be brought before a court of law. This is a list of the 45 people who died in custody since detention without trial was introduced in 
Steve Beaker was buried in King Williamstown eight days ago. Although 20,000 mourners turned up from all over South Africa, many more were unable to get there because of harassment by the security police. The Anglican funeral turned into one of the biggest political rallies ever seen in South Africa and lasted for five hours. At the end of a day of anger, celebration and tears, one question remained. Would this peaceful ceremony mark the end of attempts to reach a non-violent solution to South Africa's racial problems?
Steve Biko said, no race possesses the monopoly of beauty, intelligence, force, and there is room for all of us at the rendezvous of victory. Okay, so when we think about uh, what to take away from that video, try and think about how the situation in South Africa was similar to the situation for Jews in, in Germany uh, during the 1930s and during World War II, uh, what life was like for Cambodians under the Pol Pot regime, what life is like for the Northern Irish in, um, uh, in, um, in Great Britain, and so kind of think about these similarities and, and what do these individuals that are tortured have in common and what are some of the conditions that they're, they're living under. Um, as we move forward in our anti-apartheid um, uh, uh, history, if you will, there was also protests in the United States about um, uh, divesting again in in um, South Africa. So this was the movement that was on campuses uh, when I was an undergraduate on college. So this was the kind of cause of the 1980s and what would um, there would be protests on college campuses about in, um, in the 1980s. Um, all right, just to kind of uh, end up here, um, in the 1970s, there were still forced resettlements, and we could see that in the video where individuals were forced to live or stay in one settlement versus the other. And so in the 1970s and 80s, you'd have these clashes and revolts between black protesters and government security forces that you saw highlighted in the, in the video. Um, by uh, 1989, F.W. de Klerk, the gentleman on the left, became president in, uh, of South Africa, and he begins the process of desegregation. And it's under his leadership that Mandela is released from prison in 1990, and eventually the the repealed, the remaining apartheid laws in 1991, opening the way for Mandela to be elected president in 1994. Um, right now, there is a movie out called uh, Mandela: Long Walk to Freedom. Uh, it's playing in theaters um, over the holidays, so maybe it'll still be playing by the time the semester begins. But it highlights the. The life of Nelson Mandela, particularly his younger years, uh, and the activities that he engaged in and, and part of that uh, peaceful protest as well as part of a militant movement. Um, and so you can kind of see things from, from that perspective if you choose to go and see that movie. All right, so once again, in this, in this module on torture, be thinking about why do states engage in this activity? What are some of the tactics? What are some of the um, rationales for their engaging in torture or genocidal behavior? What are some of the examples? If we go back to our measurement um, uh, module when we talked about studying human rights, we we're really what we've done here is looked at five or six case studies, and so we want to compare and contrast those. What do they have in common? What makes one type of genocide or torture um, example different from others. So be thinking about those types of questions as you're reading the material and as you go back and maybe review some of the some of the um, information in the video lectures. Um, this concludes module number five and so toward the next couple days uh, we will be beginning the, um, the midterm and so that will bring us right up to spring break. Okay, I will see you uh, after spring break and after the midterm.